It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Speaker, uh, looking back on the past few months, uh, I am struck by the fact that on so many issues, whether it's health care or housing or making life more affordable, the government has let people down. They've shown that in their priorities. People are struggling to find a family doctor and rural emergency rooms are closing while this government subsidizes a private luxury spa in downtown Toronto. While the price of housing has ballooned and housing starts have dropped, this government spent the season reversing their own legislation and blocking new housing. My question to the Premier is, will the Premier admit that he has lost touch with the people of Ontario? The government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, look, when we came to office in 2018, we inherited a province of Ontario that was in deep trouble, a province that had out-of-control uh, taxes, a province that had out-of-control red tape, a province that had lost 300,000 jobs. Our manufacturing uh, uh, manufacturers were being hollowed out. We had communities fighting each other with respect to energy in the province of Ontario. People were having to make the choice between heating or eating, Mr. Speaker. And what we have now is a province that has created over seven. 100,000 jobs, $40 billion worth of economic activity coming back. Our manufacturers creating jobs like never before. $8 billion of cost to those job creators has been removed. We have removed red tape from them, Mr. Speaker. We've lowered taxes for the people of the province of Ontario. We're building hospitals, long-term care homes. We're rebuilding our education system. The job isn't done, Mr. Speaker, but we are going to continue on the path of rebuilding the province of Ontario. The supplementary question. Oh, Speaker, no wonder they can't get out of here fast enough, right? They should be rolling up their sleeves right now to address the priorities of Ontarians. Serving, serving, serving the people as government is a privilege and it can be gone sooner than you think. People expect their premier to be working hard every day to make their lives better, but what they've got instead is somebody who puts his interests, his friends first, every single time. Instead of hiring more doctors or building more housing or strengthening our local schools, we've got backroom deals, RCMP criminal investigations, and hundreds of millions of dollars wasted breaking contracts. What does the Premier have to say to hard-working Ontarians who feel like they have taken a back seat to his pet projects? Members, please take their seats. Government House Leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would agree with the member opposite. Ontarians know all too well how quickly the gains of the last number of years can be lost. We're seeing that play out in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. The people of the province of Ontario understand that in 2018, when we came to office, we had a province that was bleeding jobs to other provinces, to the United States, Mr. Speaker. 300,000 jobs were lost. The manufacturing Order. sector in this province was hollowed out, Mr. Speaker. Our students were not achieving the results that they should be, Mr. Speaker. Our hospitals were not at the, at the, uh, uh, at the height of what they could be for the people of the province of Ontario. The, the health care advantage that we had, we had lost, Mr. Speaker. Fast forward to today, and I will admit the job is not done. We have created over seven, the conditions for over 700,000 jobs, 40 billion dollars worth of economic activities coming back to the province Response. of Ontario, and we're doing that while we're moving costs for the people of the province of Ontario, lowering taxes, cutting red tapes, building a bigger, better, stronger, safer Ontario. The final supplementary. Speaker, the session might be ending, but people's problems aren't. And six years in, I, I, I would challenge you to find a person out there who's not a personal friend of the Premier whose life has gotten better under this government. We have emergency rooms closing, right? We have construction Order. stopped. You could have kick-started the construction of real affordable housing options so that young people can build a home, but the government said no. We could have connected 2.4 million people with a family doctor, but the government said no. We could have reduced congestion on the 401 by lifting the tolls on the 407 for truckers so that people could get home to their families faster, and this government said no. 
When will this government start saying yes to real solutions for real people? Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What we have said no to are the exact same policies that brought the province of Ontario to its knees in 2018. Order. We inherited a province that was overly regulated, one of the most heavily regulated provinces, jurisdictions in the world. We, in we inherited a province where its people were overtaxed, where people had to decide between heating their home or putting food Order. on the table. We inherited Order. a province where communities were fighting each other, Mr. Speaker. We inherited a province that was not building long-term care. We inherited a province whose hospitals needed to be rebuilt, Mr. Speaker. We inherited a province where our roads, infrastructure were so sorely undervalued by the previous NDP Liberal government. Order. What we have done since then is reinvest in the people of the province of Ontario. We've lowered taxes. We've brought back investments. Spots. She talks about the friends of the government. The people I consider friends are the seven hundred thousand Ontarians who have the dignity of a job, who have hope and opportunity in a bigger, better, stronger The next question, back to the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. I'd remind uh, the Minister that today in Ontario, people are dying in the streets. Right? Parents are going to turn up at emergency rooms which are closed with their sixth child. That is the Ontario we are living in today. The question Yesterday, Order. the Financial Accountability Office released its report into the Order. Ministry of Children and Community uh, Social Services, and for millions of, of Ontarians, of Education will come to order. pretty clear today that they are not this government's priority. Leaping from the page is the FAO's projection that there's going to be an overall shortfall of $3.7 billion. That's the difference between what the government has allocated and what's needed to maintain program funding levels. Speaker, can the Premier explain this discrepancy? Yeah, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. As I said yesterday, the, F the FAO's opinions don't reflect actual government spending sp and investments, Mr. Speaker. And I'll make it very clear, Mr. Speaker. Again, the opposition sometimes struggles with fact, so I'll, I'll say it as slowly as I can, Order. Mr. Speaker. Order. The investments in the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services Member increased for Hamilton by more than $630 million this year. Every single program from the Prime Minister has seen an increase of investment, Mr. Speaker. The year before, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services received an investment of more than $900 million. 1.2 billion the year before. Now, Mr. Speaker, what has the opposition done? Voted against every yeah. single measure to life, make life more affordable, make the services more accessible for Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, of Spons. course Ontarians are seeing it. That's why they returned two members from two by-elections, and the NDP was shut out once again, Mr. Speaker, in this block. The member will take a seat. The minister will take a seat. Supplementary question. Speaker, the, the minister can try to brush off the FAO numbers, but guess who provides Order. the numbers to the FAO? The ministry themselves. It's their own numbers. Even if the member for Nepean will come to order. Speaker, families of kids with autism have been on a roller coaster ride of changing programs and reversals and overhauls, and they deserve a program that works. And the FAO's uh, report shows very clearly that, again, social services are going to be underfunded again by about $3.7 billion. They deserve, those families, a program that works, one that can deliver for them not only the funding that they desperately need, but also the services to help their kids while they can still uh, make a difference. So I want the Premier to explain to people Question. and families in need why he is underfunding social services by $3.7 billion. Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. So once again, uh, Mr. Speaker, I will gladly share some facts with the leader of the official opposition because they always seem to miss them. You'll see them every quarter, Mr. Speaker. They'll get up and talk about the numbers. When public accounts and actual numbers come out, 
silence over there, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, because yeah. they have yeah. absolutely yeah. nothing yeah. to say yeah. to facts, right? Cameras right. are off then at that point, so you'll yeah. never hear NDP go in front of cameras at that Order. point, Mr. Speaker. Silence. The facts speak for themselves, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here. Now, the FAO, when it comes to the Ontario Autism Program, I'll say the that the FAO Catholic has signed Singapore. an average number to the children and youth in the program, Mr. Speaker. There is no such a thing as an average child with autism, Mr. Speaker. And the OEP does not treat children and youth as statistics, Mr. Speaker. Support is based on individual needs. Mr. Speaker, as I've said this many times, we doubled Spons. the Ontario Autism Program. We let the, it was the community that built this program. This year, we invest the, increased the investment by over $120 million, Mr. Speaker. Now, this isn't even the same pro Thank you very much. And the final supplementary. Speaker, only this, only this government could say they double the funding and everything gets worse. It's outrageous. Uh, uh, Seventy thousand. Here, here's, here's another number for the government. Seventy thousand. Children on the wait list for autism services. The wait list. The wait list. Spending on child and youth services, which includes the autism program, is only expected to grow by 0.2 percent, right, over the next five years. Can you imagine, Speaker, that this year only one in seven of those kids on that wait list are going to get the services they need? 10,000 out of 70,000 kids in need. I want to ask Question. the Premier. On what planet does he think that that is acceptable to the people of the province of Ontario? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much. Of course, Mr. Speaker, the, the leader of the official opposition had no problems when 75 percent of families were sitting languishing on the wait list under the previous government, which they held the balance of power for three years, who could have gone to the Liberals at that time and say, bring in more funding or we will bring you down. Of course, Order. it was not a big deal for the NDP at that time. Order. Mr. Speaker, the program that we have now is nowhere near the program before. The Ontario Autism Program is a, is a world-class needs-based program, order. Mr. Speaker, that is delivering before, Mr. Speaker, let's do a compare contract, and I know the opposition likes it. Before, families received one service, Mr. Speaker. Today, just a core clinical service, Mr. Speaker. ABA, speech language pathology, mental health support, Mr. Speaker. On top Ninja of that, West families have order. access to free services as soon as they register with Access OAP, Mr. Speaker. Entry to school, family foundational services, Mr. Speaker. Urgent response. We will not leave any child behind. Do I need to remind the members that the Speaker's responsibility is to maintain order and decorum, and in order to do that, the Speaker has the ability to send people home a little early? Thank you. Start the clock. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, today marks three years since the hate-motivated terror attack that took the lives of four members of London's Afsal family, Salman, Medea, Talat, and 15-year-old Yumna, who would have been graduating this week from Oak Ridge Secondary School, leaving a child orphaned, a community grieving, and deep wounds that will never fully heal. In this House, we have a duty to honour the Afsal family with legislation that addresses the alarming rise in racism, hate and Islamophobia. My question is, what immediate steps will this government take to make sure that we never see another family and another community devastated by Islamophobic hate? Thank you. The Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member for that important questions. Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. Islamophobia or any form of racism 
and hate are completely unacceptable and no place in Ontario. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, only place in Ontario for love and harmony. Our government has taken strong action and made considerable investment to build safer communities and protect the right of all Ontarians to practice their faith safely and without any fear or fear of persecution. Mr. Speaker, in August, the Minister released the Building a Stronger and More Inclusive Ontario Action Plan. This comprehensive plan outlined over 49 initiatives from 40 partners' ministries and millions in investment from our government to combat racism and hate, dismantle the barriers and empower Response. communities. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to work with the community partners, municipalities across the government to build stronger, safer, more inclusive Ontario. We are difference of faith, background, and belief are compacted and different. Stop clock. Stop clock. <laughs> Members will please take their seats. Start the clock. Supplementary, the member for London Fanshawe. Speaker, this week the National Council of Canadian Muslim Members attended Queen's Park and they met with all party members. Even the Premier met with Isa, a cousin of 15-year-old Yamna, who was killed on this day three years ago alongside with her parents and grandmother. The Afazel family was a target of hate just because they were Muslim. Racism and hate against the Muslim community has been getting worse. The Muslim community has gone through so much, and the terrorist attack on the Afazal family has left the Muslim community asking, when will the members of this legislature put words into action and address rising hate and Islamophobia? Take their seat. The parliamentary assistant, member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to for the member for that questions. The minister has made priority during his time in the role to make a many trips to the London Muslim Mosque, where he has personally met with Imam, community leaders, and the mayor Morgan. Mr. Speaker, last spring the ministry announced. 500,000 investment to support City of London in launching a new public edification campaign, along with a digital library to anti-hate resources. And in August, the Minister and Premier Ford were joined by Muslim community leaders and the London Muslim Mosque for a roundtable discussion on how we can work together to fight Islamophobia and make Ontario a safer place to live for all. Mr. Speaker, we know our work doesn't end here. Our government will continue to take Response. action, make the critical investment needed to defend the right of every Ontarian to practice their faith peacefully with dignity and respect. Mr. Speaker, together we will continue to ensure the Absal family legacy inspire for better, brighter, and more inclusive Ontarian for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question. Member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. Constituents in my riding of Niagara West have come to me now for several years sharing their concerns about the pinch of the federal carbon tax. Each and every April, we've seen this job killing, expensive carbon tax increase, putting more and more pressures and costs on the people of Ontario. My question to the Minister of Energy, Speaker, is as our government looks at the increase in the carbon tax that is impacting families, as we head into a summer season where we know families are hoping to get out on a road trip, visit places like Niagara Region, and experience some of the best that this province has to offer. What is our government doing to ensure that we are fighting this job-killing, expensive carbon tax and putting more money back into the pockets of the hard-working people in Niagara West? From corner to corner of my riding, from lake to lake, people are telling me it's too expensive to pay the carbon tax, and they want to see a government here question. in Ontario that is standing up for them. And so my question to the Minister of Energy, how is this government defending the hard-working people of this province and fighting the job 
Kelly Carr. Thank you very much. The parliamentary assistant, the member for Renfrew, Nipissing Pembroke. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Niagara. It's just wonderful to hear his concern for the people in that area and everybody across this province with regard to the carbon tax. The carbon tax increases the cost of everything. From the field to the fork, the farmer's field to the fork, and everything between and everything that goes into it. And this summer, whether it's the cost of a hotel or the campsite or the propane to cook on that barbecue, it's going to cost more. And fuel to get there, it's going to cost more. We're reducing the cost of living for people in Ontario by reducing the gas tax by over 10 percent, 10 cents a litre, removing the cost of license plate stickers. Removing the tolls on highways 412 and 418, and of course the one fare, which is going to save people $1,600 per year. While the carbon tax caucus over there and their leader, the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, wants to raise the cost of living, we're lowering it, making it better for families, and we're doing it without that punishing carbon tax. Supplementary question, the member for Niagara West. Well, my thanks to the member for his response, and I can tell that this is a government that is focused on cutting the costs for the people of Ontario and cutting costs for the people of Niagara West. But, Speaker, when I'm in my constituency and I speak with local farmers, entrepreneurs, and also tourism operators, they are flabbergasted that Queen Crombie is uh, committed to bringing forward yet another carbon tax. We saw that the Liberals and NDP worked together in a coalition to bring in the cap-and-trade carbon tax, and it had a hugely detrimental impact to, to the people of this province. When our government came in and cut that tax, we put real money back into the hard-working pockets of the people of this province. So the local farmers, the local entrepreneurs, the local drivers in my riding who are counting on this government to stand up to the job-killing carbon tax that the federal Liberals are pushing down the throats of the people of Ontario want to know that we're on their side. And so my question to the member and to the parliamentary assistant, to the Minister of Energy, is how can we continue to take a strong step to make sure that the federal government realizes it's time to kill the job-killing carbon tax. Member for Red from Nipissing Pembroke. As we've got our powering Ontario's growth plan to make sure that we brought 700,000 jobs back to this province, we've got to have the energy to support those jobs and those families. We've got shovels in the grounds on projects across the province. Nuclear refurbishment going on at Darlington, at the Bruce, and soon to be at Pickering to make sure on that energy. New build at Bruce, new build nuclear going to be happening at Bruce. Speaker, refurbishments at Niagara Falls and Cornwall for our great hydroelectric power, the, ba the basis what is where it started. And just recently, the largest procurement of battery storage in history, almost 1,800 megawatts. That's enough to power 1.8 million homes. Speaker, we're making sure that the Ontario of the future has the power it needs to generate, to support those families, and we can do that without a job killing carbon tax. The, Cr the Crombie caucus over there has to stand with us, stand against the federal Liberals. This is the last day we're going to be here. Call them. Tell them to Thank you very much. The next question. The next question, the member for order. Member for Waterloo. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Spending an unnecessary $225 million to get out of the beer store agreement early, ending the wastewater surveillance program, these are just some of the recent careless and irresponsible decisions of this Conservative government. Tell me how the party that prides itself on fiscal responsibility is running a $9.8 billion deficit. Let's also not forget about the $6.9 million that it costs to staff the Premier's office. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Why does the government insist on making reckless decisions and using taxpayers' money to do so? Order. The members will please take their seats. Minister of Finance can respond. Well, thank you. Thank you. You know, it's, a, it's an honour to rise in this House uh, every single day, and it's a privilege to have this, this role and uh, serve the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I stand today because for the first time since 2009, 2006, the credit rating agency DBRS upgraded Ontario's rating to AA.
Ladies and gentlemen, that is what fiscal responsibility looks like. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we proved. We're proving that we can reverse the trends of the previous 15 years where we saw jobs leaving red tape, the red tape capital of North America, and no fiscal plan whatsoever. Credit downgrade, Response. but we've been able to reverse that trend in six short years where now jobs are flocking back to Ontario. The conditions for economic. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, Speaker, let's continue with the reckless decisions. How about the 2.4 million Ontarians who do not have access to primary health care and the 70,000 kids on a wait list for autism programs? On the education funding, $1,500 less per student and on $426 million in cuts to colleges and universities. For this government, it is always private profits over people. Speaker, my question to the Premier. When will this government take responsibility for their actions and reprioritize the needs of Ontarians, the very people that were elected to serve? Never in the history of this province has a government spent so much, so irresponsibly, and got so little for the people that we serve. Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, the member opposite for that question, the finance critic in this House. Of course, uh, of course, she's able to read the budget, which unfortunately she did not vote for, along with her party, which increased health care investments by $10 billion over the last two years. That increased education funding by $4 billion over the last two years. That increased social services by over $2 billion. That's what real investment in the people of Ontario looks like, Mr. Speaker. But you know what this credit upgrade will allow us to do? It will help lower the province's borrowing costs. Mr. Speaker, what a, what a concept. It will also protect taxpayers and support more investment in Ontario, creating more jobs and financing the province's historic infra infrastructure plan, Mr. Speaker. That's what real government looks like. That's what a plan to build for the people of Ontario, all 16 Aunts. million people, looks like. And it's this party that's doing it for the people of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ajax. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. We disagree with the Liberals about a lot of things, but one fundamental difference is when it comes to taxes. Liberals believe they know how to spend money better than the hardworking people that earn it. They think a dollar in their pocket is better than the pocket of the worker who earned it. We have seen every time we act to lower costs, the federal government steps in place with a new tax hike and try to offset it. That is why we're so firm in our opposition to the carbon tax. We'll never support an inflationary tax that makes it harder for people to fill up their tanks at the pump and put food on their table. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government's approach is different from the Liberals' approach? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, the difference between our government's approach and the Liberal approach could not be more clear. We cut gas tax to save families at the pump. They raised the carbon tax to add 23 cents a litre at the pump to make it more expensive. We allow businesses to accelerate in-year equipment write-offs, saving them a billion dollars. The Liberals plan to get rid of their in-year equipment write-off allowance, costing businesses more money. Now, I spoke with an Ontario manufacturer who said to me last night, as a matter of fact, Orleans, every dollar I spend on the carbon tax is a dollar I can't invest to reduce my carbon footprint. The Liberal carbon tax does not Bonds. work. We need them to follow our lead. Speaker, scrap the carbon tax today. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The minister is right. The difference between our approach and the Liberals' approach could not be clearer. We're the party of lower taxes, while the Liberals will always be the party of higher taxes. Just look at their leader, Bonnie Crombie, who has supported every single Liberal tax hike over the last 20 years. She's watched as her friends in the previous Liberal government sought to crush our manufacturing sector with their higher taxes. And now she won't even stand up to the Prime Minister to tell him to scrap that turbo tax. Yeah, 
Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how the Liberals need to follow our lead and scrap their tax today? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. First four months of this year, more than 80,000 good paying jobs have been created in Ontario. Last month alone, we added 25,000 jobs, including 5,800 in manufacturing. By lowering costs across the board, our government has created the conditions for job growth, uh, growth across the province. We have cut 500 pieces of red tape that the Liberals impose to stifle economic growth. And we've reduced the cost of doing business by eight billion dollars in the province every single year. Now, we cannot let the Liberal carbon tax lose Ontario's momentum. Speaker, we have shown the Liberals the way. Lower taxes create jobs. Lower taxes create wealth in Ontario. Speaker, we ask the Liberals to scrap the carbon tax today. Next question, member for Sudbury. Hope Air provides free flights and services for patients living in underserved and remote communities in Ontario. And without it, a lot of Northerners wouldn't be able to access essential medical care. Darlene Sargent from my writing said, when I needed help getting to medical appointments, Hope Air arranged everything free of charge. What would I have done without them? Speaker, tomorrow is Hope Air Day in Sudbury. My question is, will the Speaker, instead of funding for profit clinics, uh, will the Premier provide sustainable funding to Hope Air? Thank you. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I am very familiar with Hope Air um, and uh, completely appreciate and understand the very valuable service that they provide, um, offering free of charge flights for uh, families and young people who need to have access. Um, but we, as a government, have made a commitment to enhance the Northern Ontario Travel Grant, and those enhancements are going to greatly assist when individuals need to travel further than 100 kilometres, and they are going to get additional service through a number of pathways, and the uh, mileage, of course, starting at mile kilometer one instead of 100 and um, expansion of the program including simplifying some of the forms that have to be filled out as part of the program we're going to invest but we're also going to invest in community Response. services so that people don't have to travel as far <laughs> supplementary member for Sudbury. thank you speaker uh, back to the premier when he needs to bring his kids to sick kids in Toronto, my constituent Chaz struggles to cover the costs. Uh, Chaz has to pay up front for hotel, gas, and food, and then he applies for the Northern Health Travel Grant, and then he has to hope he'll get some of that money back. And I say some because the medical rate for hotel rooms has increased to $250 a night. That means that it's more expensive and Chaz won't get all of his money back. The Northern Health Travel Grant, even with the changes, won't pay him back the money out of his pocket, Speaker. This is unfair to Northerners. When will the Conservative government finally fix the Northern Health Travel Grant? Minister of Health. You know, when I made the announcement of the um, enhancements to the Northern Travel Grant uh, in Thunder Bay, I have to say that there was a lot of excitement and appreciation for the enhancements that we've made. And um, I want to thank my colleagues who came forward with suggestions and ideas on how to improve the process. Clearly, we need to ensure that people who qualify can uh, quickly get their um, money uh, from the provincial government, which is why we have enhanced and um, allowed online submissions, allowed direct-to-bank um, deposits. So we will continue to make enhancements, um, but the fact that this NDP party continues to speak against enhancements for local community diagnostic Response. and surgical centers speaks to their interest in keeping the status quo while we do the improvements that are necessary and needed. Thank you. Order. Order. The next question. The member for Ottawa Vanier. Many Ontarians have lost trust in the ability of the Licensed Appeal Tribunal to fairly adjudicate homeowner warranty disputes with Terrell. Homeowner success rate at the LAT is very low, 
with Canadians for Property properly built homes reporting that homeowners have lost around 84 percent of appeals since 2006. In recent years, the number of appeals made by homeowners has dropped dramatically, with 208 issues appealed in 2006 and only four in 2023. Mr. Speaker, these numbers suggest that homeowners no longer trust the lack to fairly adjudicate their appeals of Tarion warranty decisions, and I need to ask the Attorney General, will he commit to reviewing, reviewing the effectiveness of the lab in handling homeowner appeals of Tarion warranty decisions? And to reply, the Attorney General. Speaker, and I'm pleased to have the, the chance to talk about the LAT because it was one of the first tribunals that we brought back into balance, hitting all of their marks in terms of uh, filing the hearing dates. Mr. Speaker, uh, the LAT was, was a tremendous success, and under the leadership of, of Sarah Mintz, uh, who did a phenomenal job getting the LAT back on track so that uh, it, it was so effective that, that sometimes the lawyers were saying, you're moving too fast, Mr. Speaker. But in fact, we have moved fast, we have come back to balance, and I'm quite proud of the work that the LAT is doing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there's clear evidence that the LAT lacks the ability to be an impartial arbiter of disputes between homeowners and Terrians. CPBH has identified that the adjudicators who are hearing appeals to the LAT often do not have the, expert, the expertise in new home construction required to effectively adjudicate these cases, and that the criteria they are using to evaluate the cases are often Tarion's own construction performance guidelines. Additionally, the LAT has not had Tarion's guidelines independently reviewed by a third party to assess their appropriateness. With only four appeals by homeowners to the LAT in 2023, homeowners are clearly choosing not to go to the tribunal anymore, and something is obviously wrong. Will the Attorney General commit to implementing a third-party review of Tarion's construction performance guideline and to ensuring that the adjudicators hearing these appeals have the training and expertise required to make informed decisions? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And there, we'll start with the License Appeal Tribunal and the fact that it's an independent tribunal, Mr. Speaker, as part of Tribunals Ontario and the excellent work that they're doing under the leadership of Sean Weir. Mr. Speaker, there's continuous training. There's training when, when the adjudicators are onboarded. Uh, there's rigorous review of those that are appointed to the tribunal, Mr. Speaker. So I, I can commit to continued uh, training and, and excellence, Mr. Speaker, and that there is continuous review, but they are an independent unit. So, uh, you know, I don't plan to meddle in the independence of the tribunals, Mr. Speaker, uh, but I do look forward to their continued improvement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And the next question, the member for Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. People in the riding of Oxford have repeatedly expressed concerns over the rising cost of living and how the Liberal carbon tax is making their lives more difficult. Yep. But, Speaker, instead of helping Ontario families, the federal government increased the disastrous carbon tax by 23 per cent, and they will continue to hike it every year until, it, until it's tripled. That's just not right. No one in this province deserves to be punished by a useless tax that does nothing for the environment and takes away people's hard-earned paychecks. Our government will not stop calling on the federal liberals to will not stop calling on the federal liberals to finally do the right thing and scrap this tax. Here, here, here. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is mitigating the negative effects of the liberal carbon tax? Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the excellent member for Oxford for that timely question. And indeed, it is true that the Liberal carbon tax increases the cost of goods and services that have the most direct impact on the day to day lives of Ontarians. Whether at the gas pump, the grocery store, or shopping for everyday essentials, the Liberal carbon tax affects each and every one of us negatively. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, this government will never stop looking for ways to save money for the hard-working people of Ontario. Our government understands that Ontarians should not face financial burden when interacting with government. That is why we have delivered ways for Ontarians to save time and money 
when engaging with Service Ontario in person or online. More options, more service, more convenience, and of course, we include with that the removal of license plate sticker Fonts. fees and renewals. So while the Liberals work to make life less affordable, we have the backs of Ontarians making life more affordable. Thank you. Thank you. This supplementary question. Well, thank you again, Speaker, and thank the Minister for the response. The parliamentary budget officer has been very clear that the majority of us will pay more in carbon taxes than we get back in rebates. Ontarians will not be fooled. They know the carbon tax is just another Liberal tax grab. Speaker, families across the province are looking for our government for support. We must continue to find ways to reduce costs across the board and ensure that people are not facing any additional burdens. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government is delivering real affordability to Ontarians by keeping costs down for essential services? Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, I again thank the member for Oxford for that question. Our government believes that reducing the time and money it takes to interact with government is essential. At Service Ontario, we've simplified online renewals for driver's licenses and health cards. We permanently waived fees for delayed death registration for Indigenous peoples, and we've made registering newborns faster and more affordable. And I must add, Mr. Speaker, that just yesterday we saw a tremendous act of bipartisanship as this House came together to unanimously pass Bill 200, the Protecting Homeowners Act. It passed unanimously at third reading so that upon royal assent, all those who have been victims of the insidious, nosy scams can breathe a sigh of relief. Help, indeed, has arrived. So, Speaker, I would like to thank all of the honourable members of this House who supported that bill Response. and who chose to send a clear message. They support legislation that reduces burdens for Ontarians, especially as the federal Liberals continue to fail this nation. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dunbar. Speaker, my question for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. We cannot take clean air for granted, especially as the climate emergency fuels more and more wildfires in our province. We just need to look back to last summer's unprecedented wildfire season. We all in our communities saw the smoky skies, felt it burn our lungs. We even smelt it right in this chamber. Wildfire smoke is toxic. It contains ultra-fine particulate that penetrates deep into our body. Ontario has an air quality health index, but this ministry does not track that ultra-fine particulate, which is completely negligent. Almost all other provinces do so, but Ontario hasn't acted. So, my question, when will you update the Air Quality Health Index so people have the information that they need to keep themselves and their families safe? To respond, the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, this government, under the leadership of this Premier, is taking swift action when it comes to climate change resiliency and adaptation. Just look at the results, uh, Speaker. If you just look at what we've done to build resiliency, whether it's Ontario's forest sector strategy, our community wildfires protection plans, our climate risk and resiliency assessments, the 92 per cent we've increased in wildfire uh, funding, wetland conservation partnerships, we've dedicated $30 million in funding. We protected thousands of hectares of wetlands, but, Speaker, every step of the way, when this government tries to build up the uh, build up Ontario, create great jobs, create green jobs, invest in our, all our manufacturing sector while creating EVs, fighting climate change every step of the way, Speaker, unfortunately, we have no support from the opposition because their only plan is a carbon tax and a tax plan. On this side of the House, we know that a carbon tax is a tax plan, Response. not an environment plan. Thank you. Any supplementary question? Speaker, this is a government that doesn't even have a climate plan and has an abysmal reputation when it comes to the environment. And this government is also failing the people of Amjanong First Nations. Amjanong First Nation declared a state of emergency last month because of its high levels of benzene pollution in the air. This government continues to ignore Amjanong's air quality recommendations. For Brampton North, come to order. Consult. I'll repeat it again failed to consult the First Nation on this government's new regulations for the Ineos plant in Sarnia. So, to the Premier or to the Environment Minister, please explain why, in a First Nations community, you are allowing uh, benzene to be admitted at concentrations that hourly 
would trigger a shutdown in California and are 10 times the annual amount that is allowed by any other emitter in the province. Please try and explain that. Mr. The Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, speaker, uh, since we, our government learned of the issue around benzene levels and NUOs, we've taken swift action. After multiple orders, in addition to that, uh, we've been working with everyone, whether it's the First Nations community, the municipality of Sarnia, the first responders, and other involved stakeholders to find the source of the leak and hold the plant accountable. A plant, which may add, Speaker, is currently closed. In addition to this, we have introduced penalties per violation. $100,000 per violation will now apply to this company. This regulation is part of a larger coordinated response that is underway to include regular site visits, multiple provincial orders, suspension of the company's environmental compliance approval, and enhanced 24-7 benzene monitoring. These are actions that will ensure the facility currently shut down for maintenance will fully address the causes and sources of the emissions before resuming operations. Speaker. We take the health and safety of the residents of Sarnia and the entire community very seriously and will continue to use every tool necessary to get to the bottom of this. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My, uh, my question is to the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Speaker, Ontarians have observed a growing number of media reports about cybersecurity breaches occurring worldwide. As our information technology systems progress, cyber criminals are also becoming increasingly sophisticated. Governments must be prepared to combat cybercrime in all its forms. It is our responsibility to find ways to protect the integrity and security of our digital infrastructure while safeguarding citizens' privacy and rights. Speaker, this objective extends beyond the Ontario government. Collaboration with our partners across the broader public sector is crucial to ensuring everyone's safety. Could the minister please explain how Bill 194, if passed, will enhance cybersecurity and promote collaboration with the Ontario government's partners? Thank you. Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Well, I thank uh, the member, the excellent member for Mississauga East Cooksville through you, Mr. Speaker. And as that member well knows, and I hope all members know, that in today's digital landscape, it's essential for our government to address cyber crimes and protect our digital infrastructure. So we have implemented a comprehensive Ontario public service-wide cybersecurity program to safeguard public data. This strategy was refreshed in 2023 to enhance cyber protection across the Ontario public sector and strengthen broader public sector resilience. We work closely with our BPS partners to bolster the province's cyber resilience and the security of public services. Our focus includes enhancing, enhancing cyber threat prevention, monitoring and intelligence capabilities. Our government is committed to implementing secure protocols to protect against large-scale cyber attacks and personal information thefts, especially in our hospitals and our schools. This is why our government is leading unprecedented— Thank you. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. The Minister highlighted the crucial work being done in collaboration with the broader public sector. Partnering with these entities is vital as their impact touches all Ontarians across the province. Speaker, in recent months, hospitals, schools, and municipalities have fallen victim to cyber crimes by bad actors. The personal information of citizens has been compromised and could be exploited for further criminal activities. Protecting private information is paramount, especially when it concerns children and society's most vulnerable. Could the minister please elaborate on the specific efforts undertaken to protect hospitals, schools, and municipalities from these criminal activities and the steps that will be implemented under Question. Bill 194 if passed. Thank you. Mr. Public and Business Service Delivery. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member again for a very timely question. Speaker, our government takes immense pride in safeguarding our broader public sector partners. We continually work with them, incorporating their feedback to implement appropriate safeguards and adjustments in the realm of cybersecurity. Let me be clear, these costs to public sector institutions 
due to cyber attacks from bad actors are utterly unacceptable. We must protect all of our hospitals, our schools and our municipalities from cyber attacks at all costs. The financial burden of cyber attacks on these institutions is staggering, as much as $7 million just to recover from one. If Bill, 94, Bill 194 is passed, we will advance our government's mandate to protect all Ontarians from cybercrime in a safe manner, and we will particularly protect our children. We are modernizing Response. for the future to embrace the digital era, and it's this Premier and this government that, is doing, that are doing everything possible. Thank, Thank you. Ontario. Thank you very much. <laughs> Member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business. Speaker, my riding of Simcoe Gray is home to thousands of small businesses that provide goods and services to the residents of Ontario and good-paying jobs. The Liberal carbon tax, Speaker, is hurting those businesses dramatically. Not only is it driving up inflation, it is increasing the cost of essential goods and services that small business owners and their customers rely on, from groceries to gas and utilities. Speaker, Ontarians have had enough of this costly tax. They know that it is nothing more than another tax grab by the Liberal government. Unlike the opposition NDP and independent Liberals, our government remains steadfast in standing up for the people of this province. We will continue to call on the federal government to put an end to this regressive measure. Mr. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain to this House why the federal uh, carbon tax must be terminated and why it is killing jobs? Associate Minister of Small Business. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Simcoe Gray for raising a very important issue. I have had the opportunity to hold numerous industry-specific roundtables with entrepreneurs across the province. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? The message has been loud and clear. This carbon tax is crippling small businesses and hurting the people of Ontario. They shared how it's driving up the costs of everyday necessities, from the cost of supplies, from convenience for Orleans, stores come to and farmers' markets, to the gas needed to fuel delivery services and heavy machinery, to the high energy cost of cooling in warehousing and logistics. Speaker, this is putting immense pressure on their businesses and making it increasingly difficult for them to keep their doors open and serve their customers. That's why this Premier and this government have strongly opposed the carbon tax, while the opposition NDP Response. and independent Liberals have been siding with their Liberal allies today in the strongest possible terms. Thank you. Thank you very much. The member for Simcoe Gray, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for her response. These are tough economic times, Speaker, and the Liberal carbon tax is further stretching the already tight budgets of Ontarians. Speaker, the opposition are out of touch when they expect our economy to keep growing while people's savings and disposable income get eaten away by more taxes. We know that the NDP and Liberals have no intention of standing up for the people of this great province. In fact, Speaker, they support the federal government's plan to triple the carbon tax to $170 per ton by 2030. This is completely at odds with the priorities of this government. As we stay committed to protecting Ontarians' workers, families and the, from these rising costs. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please tell the House what measures our government is taking to keep costs Question. down for small businesses and households in the face of this disastrous tax? Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the member for his uh, question. Mr. Speaker, unlike the tax a lot Bonnie Crombie and her loyal federal Liberal counterparts, our government understands the very real concerns that Ontario families and small businesses have about the impacts of the federal carbon tax. We have such a diverse caucus filled with former entrepreneurs who can speak from experience. When we stand in this House and say that this tax represents a serious hurdle that stands in the way of Ontario being the entrepreneurial powerhouse, we've worked so hard to make it. From day one, our Premier has been laser-focused on making life more affordable for the people of Ontario. Whether it's measures providing tax relief for families, lowering gas taxes, reducing beer and wine taxes, cancelling cap-and-trade and ensuring industrial electricity rates remain nationally competitive, our government is squarely on the side of Ontario workers, families and job Response. creators. We will continue fighting the federal carbon tax every step of the way. Enough is enough. Scrap the tax. The next question, a member from Niagara Centre. 
Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, yesterday it was announced that Ontario is terminating the wastewater surveillance program designed to monitor infectious diseases. Dr. Thomas Piggott, the Medical Officer of Health and CEO of Peterborough Public Health, responded on X, stating, deeply disappointed to learn that funding has been cancelled for the wastewater surveillance program in Ontario. This has been critical, not only for COVID-19, but also for other infectious disease threats such as influenza, RSV, MPOX, polio, and now H5N1 in Ontario. Speaker, with a serious gap in the federal government's current ability to test wastewater in Ontario, why would this government abruptly cut this extremely low-cost but highly valuable program? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, speaker, uh, let me be clear that the program will continue as Canada does um, water surveillance, and Canada will continue to do that. Ontario is simply getting rid of a duplication. The federal government conducts wastewater surveillance across Canada and is actually moving to expand its, uh, the its sampling uh, processes uh, with additional sites here in Ontario. So moving forward, uh, what we're doing is the Ministry of Health will be working with public health agencies of, of Canada on data sharing agreements to ensure that the province can continue to analyze uh, Ontario-specific wastewater data. Speaker, we'll also work with the federal government to propose sampling sites uh, that provide quality data for public health across the province. The program will continue to collect and analyze samples and will collaborate with Public Health Ontario. Thanks, you. Thank you, Speaker. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. That's against the advice of the government's own advisory committee. In, in September 2023, the Ontario Public Health Emergency Science Advisory Committee released a report that stated, quote, we recommend that the government of Ontario continue wastewater-based surveillance for SARS-CoV-2 and evaluate its role for influenza and RSV for early virus detection and indication of variants of concern to reduce existing inequities in clinical surveillance. Speaker, if this government is potentially wasting a billion dollars to put beer in corner stores a year earlier than it would have otherwise happened, surely they can spare less than 1% of that to continue this vital public health program. With this government's usefulness extending, uh, this uh, program's usefulness extending beyond COVID, why would the government ignore medical Question. expert advice and scrap this advanced program? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker, the program is continuing through an expanded option with the federal government. Uh, and let me quote you uh, a doctor who was actually on the Ontario COVID-19 science table who did an interview as early as this morning. And he, quote, says, I don't see any reason why it should be provincially managed as opposed to federally managed, uh, end quote, said Dr. Razik. And, uh, and he goes on to say, Quote, it is not unreasonable for the federal government to take over a centralized approach to testing, uh, said the doctor. I would say that from a public health perspective and a science perspective, I think that the public should want and is available available information should remain timely and comprehensive. And quote, Speaker, this information will still be timely and comprehensive. The only difference, Speaker, is removing a duplication because the federal government is expanding expanding the surveillance program Fonts. to continue expansions here in Ontario. Here, here, here. Next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. This week, we're celebrating Local Food Week in Ontario. It's an opportunity to promote farmers while also recognizing the important role of food processors, restaurants, retail, and others across the local food supply chain. Speaker, Ontario has a robust food industry that contributes over 48 billion dollars to our province's GDP and economy, representing more than 860,000 jobs. This vital sector must continue to grow and produce more food for Ontario's growing population and our exporting market. Unfortunately, the carbon tax not only places a heavy economic burden on our farmers, it also impacts the global standing of the whole agricultural sector. Speaker, can the minister please explain to the House why the Liberals must Question. roll back this punitive tax? Thank you, Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, I thank the member from Chatham Camp Leamington for the question. The members of this House have heard many times from the minister and from the constituents at home the Liberal carbon tax takes a serious toll on farmers, both financially and emotionally. It's a competitive business. Carbon tax is a direct and indirect cost to all sectors and consumer goods. In a time when affordability is a major concern for all Ontarians, the carbon tax is nothing more than a tax grab, adding no additional supports or services to the people in this province. Think about it. Ontario greenhouse growers were charged $16 million in carbon tax in 2023. Gross. Grain farmers of Ontario estimate that by 2030, grain and oilseed farmers will have paid $2.7 billion in carbon tax. To be. We have heard the Response. Minister of Transportation inform this House that the long-haul truckers are paying an average of $15,000 to $20,000 a year in carbon tax. That's a direct cost on taking our— Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the parliamentary assistant for that response. Ontario food processing businesses like Wiles and Wheatley, Highbury Can Co Corporation in Leamington, and others across Chatham Kent Leamington are global leaders in safe, fresh, healthy food production and distribution. In fact, 56% of products produced in Ontario farms end up at one of our province's 4,900 food processors. But, Speaker, this carbon tax hinders the competitive edge our food processors need, their ability to sell products to markets locally and around the world. We need the federal Liberals to finally listen. Terminate the carbon tax today. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please explain to the House how the carbon tax is impacting food processing businesses across our province? Parliamentary assistant. to attend the Food and Beverage Ontario Conference, which brings together processors from across the province to discuss priorities to the sector. Top priority, one of the top priorities when I spoke to them was the business-busting carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, simple economics. The higher the cost of agricultural production and transportation, the higher the cost of our processed foods. Processed foods, like many other goods, compete with imports like in any other market economy. Yeah. When we have imported products coming in from jurisdictions that aren't subject to the carbon tax, there's a, they have a competitive advantage. The Premier, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, the Minister of Red Tape, they've all worked, this government has all worked to create the right conditions for businesses to succeed. 700,000 jobs coming into this province. The carbon tax works against us, and therefore it works against all Ontarians, Ontarians in fact, all Canadians. Like the, the member from Response. Pembroke, Nipissing, has just said passionately, we need to axe the tax. Yeah. <laughs> our question period for this morning. Number